Uh, and with that, I, I guess I'll dive into actually the integration discussion, dive into talking more about the applications uh, that we host, that we are, are promoting here, uh, right? That we use in our everyday lives. And one of the things I wanted to touch on today was, uh, I mean, go figure, it's going to be next cloud, but I wanted to talk about encryption specifically as it relates to next cloud. I don't know how this is going to go. I'm just going to go over it. I, I tossed okay. out a, yeah. a, a bunch yeah. of notes here and I'm, I'm going to, to try to make sense and put together a cohesive story uh, as to how we want to use encryption with Nextcloud. Sure. Yeah. So encryption is one of the steps to take when designing a system with defense in depth. Here we go over what you need to be concerned about and different implement implementations to consider. I also linked to defense in depth because this is this is a very key concept to understand. Uh, defense in depth is a military strategy that seeks to delay rather than prevent the advance of attacker, buying time and causing additional casualties by yielding space. Rather than defeating an attacker with a single strong defensive line, defense in depth relies on the tendency of an attack to lose momentum over time or as it covers a larger area. A defender can thus yield lightly defended territory in an effort to stress an attacker's logistics or spread out a numerically superior attacking force. Once an attacker has lost momentum or is forced to spread out to pacify a large area, area defensive counterattacks can be mounted on the attacker's weak points, with the goal being to cause attrition or drive the attacker back to its original starting position. The way this applies in computer science is to say, all right, nothing is ever going to be impenetrable. I mean, just the right. sheer number of breaches that we've seen this year alone should, should solidify that. So what we have to do at that point is say, all right, so if, if we cannot defend perfectly, we're going to have to defend a lot. And what that means is that at every point where we could get compromised, we want to concentrate on defending that point and then defending everything around it and then defending the entire thing. We don't just want to have one firewall and then everything through that has free free access free rain, to, to right. everything we have exactly what we want to do we want to set up passwords right we want to set up passwords for stuff inside of our networks we want to set up stuff uh passwords to get into our networks we want to set up you know uh different uh authentication measures within our networks we want to enable encryption for the data at rest in our networks right so if if something gets popped right if something gets compromised then there are other defensive measures that attackers would have to not mitigate. What's what's the word I'm looking for? That they would have to exploit. You penetrate, yeah, get across. Yeah, to penetrate, yeah. but before actually getting to something worthwhile, they would they would have to do more work than compromise one thing. And that's that's where you have that in depth part of it. It, it comes into play. You you want to have different things around different different ways to defend the same thing. Now, that being the case, we have to understand what the threat model that we're defending against is, because that's going to dictate how well-funded the attacker is, you know, how much expertise and knowledge, or what attack vectors the the attacker is, is going to have, is going to take. <clears throat> so here we start talking about threat modeling. So threat modeling is hard. Uh, the most totally. widely applicable framework that I personally have stumbled across is to frame up your model with respect to the following scopes. Uh, so from lowest to highest, defending against the neighborhood hacker, then defending against corporate surveillance, and then defending against nation state espionage. Uh, and the advice is to consider at which level you would like to defend against when considering the options available to you. Most of the stuff that a lot of people start thinking about is neighborhood hacker kind of thing. You know, people sure. jumping on Wi-Fi, cracking passwords, yada, yada, yada. 
Um, and, and, and that one is for the most part mitigated by a lot of common security measures. And, and we're going to go over some of those here. Uh, and then you have corporate surveillance, which is a little bit more heinous because a lot of them share information with each other, which here's where you start having to talk about metadata and being able to draw correlations between, you know, just huge dragnet aspects of where your where your information lives right if you can cross reference your isp with your browser history and your logins to different sites i mean you you can put together a pretty comprehensive analysis of of where someone was when doing what where you may not get the content and that's where the nation state espionage comes in they really want to get that content now they're they're re actually really good at getting metadata but what they really want is to get that content get that data get get in and, and, and grab it much like that neighborhood hacker except they're going to use all the tools at their disposal and they have unlimited funds and if you're targeted by nation state espionage you have bigger problems than securing your next cloud login right you you, you need to have a serious look at you know what's going on here because the thing about nation state espionage is that oddly enough other nation states don't like it when it's done to them so sure. a lot of the infrastructure totally. that's in in place in the various geolocations around the world have different mitigation strategies to to defend against those kind of things um, from from other nation states and then same thing with the corporate surveillance. I mean, even though there is a data market out there, right, there are still people who don't want access, that, that data is precious to them, right? So they're not gonna just leave it out there for anyone to find, right? So they're going to be also defending a portion of your interests, right? And they're gonna make sure that your connection to them is secure and, and, and a couple other things along the way. Whereas the neighborhood hacker isn't gonna really care about any of those he's just trying to get into your services he's probably trying not to get caught himself so he's taking a couple of precautions but he, he doesn't care about you in in the least and the reason i i titled this a rubber hose attack vector is is simply that because <laughs> when i saw the title i thought oh man we're really getting down into it with uh rubber hose attack vector i immediately think of someone bashing someone's knees in with like a lead pipe or something <laughs> like, exactly give me your it's... password <laughs> cutting a finger off <laughs> yeah it's you you can you can secure your encryption yeah you know, as as well as you'd like right but when someone buys you know a five dollar tire iron you know at the hardware store and comes over to your house and starts bashing you over the head with it asking you to give them your password you know it's it doesn't matter it's what like, kind of encryption you have you just right. want the beating to stop so there you, you have to consider your threat model and and what attack vectors that your your adversaries are going to be implementing against you right so if you if you have a, a fairly if you're not threatened by nation state espionage right if if you want to start talking about corporate surveillance next cloud is a great place to start because then you can own your own data and that's a way to peacefully take it away from people who would otherwise sell it and someone like us right we would we we are in the business of securing your data and and, and offering the service to you for this very purpose which is where we get into the responsibility levels of who's really responsible for securing what at which level and going through the AWS training, they pointed out three different levels of responsibility, which I think are highly applicable here. Uh, the first is like the physical level and the infrastructure level, right? So who's actually providing you the hardware, who's providing you the server, who's providing you the you know, heating and cooling, the server right. space, the network, all of that stuff. Um, all of that right now for us is handled via DigitalOcean. So in diving into that a little bit, there are two types of storage that DigitalOcean has that, you know, where where it could be encrypted, right? So the first is the local droplet storage. So think of this as the hard drive on your computer, right? And this is this is not going to be any kind of uh, object storage or, or or block storage. This is going to be just where your OS sits, and this storage uh, is 
not encrypted by default. Whereas their block storage, which is extensible storage, you can think of it as, you know, like an external USB storage Drive, or right. or like a NAS or any kind of storage array. Um, and, and that's actually what it is. It's it's a huge storage array that sits next to their compute cluster. Uh, that is all uh, encrypted at rest. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Uh, if you if you consider that your data, if if we're just talking about the local droplet storage, if, if your data is sitting on that at rest, as it were, you know, you you have a file on a computer somewhere on on your server. Then, if someone were to break into that data center and unplug the server, take it out of the rack, scamper on home with it, plug it into their network, access it, boot it up, then they would be able to grab that disk and read the contents of that disk. Well, sure. Okay, fine. But... and that sounds illogical. I'd, I'd argue that sounds kind of illogical. You're not just going to walk out. You're not just going to breaching of that physical security, that physical perimeter is going to be difficult in and of itself. Yes. Now, more or less likely, this is where I see the process kind of break down and where this could actually be a problem is, hey, we're getting rid of old servers, whatever. We migrate you off. Somehow, some way, something gets, you know, you clone it over from one one piece of hardware to another, you know, let the customer know, hey, we're spinning this up. It's on the new one. Now, what if it? this is where it gets left on the old one? Now, I know vSphere and all that is pretty good about migrating all that data over. It's left on the old one. Someone pulls the physical disks out and just pitches them. They don't degauss the drives. They don't do any kind of physical cleansing of the drives. They don't you know, take a hammer and nail to them to break them up. Someone pitches them, and sure enough, the garbage man's like, hey, guess what? I got two new drives. <laughs> or, yeah, you know, no, someone at the recycling center is just like pl- like plugging them in. And like, hey, there's still data on here. Let's kind of see what's going on here. Still, at the end of the day, both kind of far-fetched, but they're out there, right? They're they're vectors. Now, well, and there's even there's even one more that hasn't even brought been brought up yet, but that's if you're able to obtain access to a server, right? Um, right. If you're able to cold boot a server or you have a out of band, like an ILO, like a, you know, you're, you're yeah. able to yeah, have yeah, yeah. A, a virtual KVM and boot up a server, you would be able to even by installing like a boot up operating system, like D band on it or something. Just, check the discs at that point, yeah right yeah you have a you have a live dvd on it you mount the discs and and all the data is there too so you don't actually even need physical access to that uh but you do need access to the discs right right um you don't need you don't necessarily need access to the to the server physical now location that's not the same with their block storage which, like I said, their extensible storage, uh, their entire storage array is encrypted by default. Um, sure. So they have all that. They have that data at rest, right? Uh, so that's that's always good. But keep in mind, if someone's if someone's popping a server, and by popping I mean exploiting or or penetrating, right? If someone has has gotten a exploit and has access to a server, then it doesn't matter if those files were encrypted when the server shut down. Because the server is running right now, and those files are unencrypted. Unencrypted, right? And which is which is where we can transfer over to you know what is the responsibility le- responsibility level of the service provider, or the you know the application host or the the operating system admin, right? So we I I, I pointed out three things here. We got two that are planned. Uh, one is Lux encryption. So Lux encryption is a way to do this hard drive encryption as we were talking about from an operating system level so that when the operating system shut downs, it re-encrypts everything on the disk and everything is encrypted. If anyone were to boot the server up or yank the hard drive or throw it in the trash, um, everything would be encrypted there with the deluxe uh, password. So that's one thing that we, we uh, are going to be planning on, on implementing. Um, once again, that's not, 
that's not the attack vector I think that I'm most concerned about, however. No. Um, another very similar one is uh, encrypted tarballs. So the way we, we do backups is we basically compress the entire data directory that we maintain on the, on the VM and copy that down and store it locally here. Um, and then we also have snapshots that uh, this, those snapshots are also encrypted at rest uh, from DigitalOcean. Um, but the, the tarballs, while they are secure in transit or over the wire, right, are not encrypted at rest on their backup storage. Um, so that is something also that Jack and I have talked about that we want to be implementing this, this quarter. Um, and, and also something not super concerning. I mean, it's, it's in a secu the, the, the backups are secured, right? As much as any other physical security could be, uh, on a, on a secure network, right? So once again, that's not my main concern. My main concern is someone being able to get into the server and, and especially Lux isn't going to have, uh, you know, help with that. And, and encrypting tarballs isn't going to happen with that because if you think about it, as long as the operating system is running, those files are decrypted. Right. And if I were to have root access on that operating system as it's running, I can see all the files on the server. Um, it's when the server shuts down is when everything gets re-encrypted. And then we, we go back to square one, but we want to first and foremost, make sure no one gets into the server while it's running, which is why we've enabled HTTPS, which secures all the login traffic, all the backup traffic, all, all the traffic really that, that goes to that server. The easiest way to, to exploit a service that requires a login is to simply sniff the traffic. And you can do that any number of ways. You can do that with minimal permissions on a server if you've been able to exploit that. You can do that with minimal permissions on any given uh, end, end device, uh, whether that be mobile, desktop, what have you. If you're able to get that traffic that's, that's unencrypted. So what we want to have and, and what we we're concerned about having first and foremost is uh, secured HTTP, the HTTPS, uh, which I did pull up an interesting article with security evaluators and I wanted to go through, they had a, a nice couple of points in saying what HTTPS does and does not protect against. So it protects against, let's see, it encrypts the traffic between your browser and the server to prevent eavesdropping on your web requests and responses. This is often referred to as confidentiality. HTTPS also offers authentication through the certificate authority system and integrity through message authentication codes or MACs. Uh, those are actually the hashes, the CRC that we were talking about last yeah. week. Yeah. That's, that's in uh, a, a Mac. Yeah. So non-technical users frequently consider HTTPS websites as secure and HTTP is not secure, yada, yada, yada. Um, but in the rest of this blog post, we'll be discussing some of the side channel and malicious parties can use to fingerprint a user's browsing of HTTPS content, right? So HTTPS here encrypts everything you send to the server and everything the server sends to you. Now, what it does not encrypt is the DNS lookups. When you ask the DNS service to resolve, can you give me the IP address for my server range? And it says, sure. That's not over HTTPS, unless you're running like Firefox. But that's not something that the server handles, though. That's not a communication between you and the server. Therefore, it's not encrypted. Therefore, that's something that other people can snoop on. Um, caching, right? One of the things is that browsers do very well is speed up the appearance of the Internet. And they do that by caching content locally. Now, that's literally storing content that you requested security securely on your computer. If someone's able to get in, mess around with that cache, they can do stuff that the server didn't want to happen in the first place. That's a harder side channel to, to exploit, but it's still out there. Uh, now, keep in mind, there are different ways of not exploiting, but but gleaning information 
off of TLS um, through techniques like art spoofing, where you're able to um, uh, mimic MAC addresses right. 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 and and uh, intercept traffic. Um, especially, you can you can analyze a lot, even just with metadata via login log out times. Like, yeah, I can if I just sit there and look at your traffic. I uh, it's called. I forget what it was, but like back in the back in the early days, I think it was the FBI. They used to profile people based on their water usage because you could tell when someone was home and was taking a shower by when they use sure. their water, right? Yeah. So and and as humans are creatures of habit, right? You could kind of count on when someone was going to be home to take a shower, if you analyze, you know, their water bill enough, you know, you, you'd see them get into a habit. Get it, get, yeah. And then if you needed to, I, you know, ensure that they were going to be in a given place at a given time, that would be a good way to determine, you know, oh, I can see, you know, they're here or they weren't here that day or something like that. So that it, that was just a very interesting, you know, it you can, you can glean a whole bunch of information from the seemingly smallest detail. That's why, that's why you have to, profile the attack vector you have to take a look at your threat models and say all right what am i really willing to defend against right what am i really willing to have secured and and we want our the best bang for our buck and you know we we want it reasonably secured right which is why we're able to we're, we're willing to to you know give so much and put so much towards the security but we, 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 we know that we can never give 100%. So with that in mind, you know, there are a couple other things like telemetry, advertising, scams. Like HTTPS is not going to protect you from getting scammed. Oh, come on, Andrew. Come on. You can't make that guarantee. <laughs> not, not today. Not today. <laughs> That's but that's all one. something I that's that I think that's hilarious that you brought that one up. Uh, that, that's <laughs> nothing more than comedy right there with that. <laughs> HTTPS isn't going to protect you from a scam. <laughs> and so I guess for anyone that, you know, just because it has HTTPS anymore, most sites should have that. That's just encrypting traffic. That's not, does, that doesn't mean it's a verify, you know, so, some, uh, Certificate. Some certificates are issued via certificate authority. You can check, like VeriSign, and whoever. But you know, we go out and get anyone can go out and get a Let's Encrypt cert anymore. So that doesn't mean you're signing. You know, if it says banking dot Russian website dot what is it RU, <laughs> that doesn't mean you're signing into your actual bank website. <laughs> just and it's over. That just means a traffic secure. <laughs> but man, that's a good one. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> so those are those are the three things we you know we, we went over: Lux, um, encrypted tarballs, HTTPS. Those are three things I think that is the service provider, the operating system admin's responsibility. Right now. We get down here to the third level here, which is the application administrator or the the consumer uh, of the of the service, and and there is actually still a weighty amount that they have to be responsible for. Right, first of all, they need to be not connecting to my bank ru and preventing themselves from from that. But there's a couple other things too. So <laughs> so what we don't have then. If if we, we we start thinking about this, we can we can implement Lux, which is going to be encryption at rest, or as I like to say, encryption at off. So if your server's off, it's encrypted. If your server's right. on, all bets are off. So what Nextcloud brings to the table is a couple different encryption types. And I'm going to actually start with their blog post encryption in Nextcloud because it it really does a good job of highlighting what is available. We went over what encryption is. We went over threat modeling. So encryption in Nextcloud. Nextcloud offers multiple layers of encryption for your data. 
First, data is protected when being transferred between clients and servers, as well as between servers. Second, data can be encrypted on storage. And last but not least, we offer end-to-end -end encryption in the clients. Each has their place and offers a different kind of protection, suitable pr to protect from a specific type of threat and they go into these types of threats. Now we just talked about HTTPS, right? And they say Nextcloud uses plain and simple HTTP traffic for all file handling, which can be protected with TLS, which we do do. TLS protects against attacks to capture data in transit between the server and client. It does not protect against a hacked device or server but prevents data transfers on insecure networks like public Wi-Fi networks, mobile devices, or third-party networks from being intercepted and is thus invaluable for a NextCloud deployment. That's something that we consider non-negotiable and implement by default and irreversibly. The next is storage encryption. And this one, this one gets interesting and you'll, you'll see why in a second here. So the NextCloud server-side encryption feature provides secure storage of data by encrypting each file with a unique file key before it's stored. File keys are encrypted in turn either by a server-wide key or a per-user key. Now that's important here. So you can do this one of two types of ways. You can either do this per server, so like per NextCloud, like you have one NextCloud instance, so that entire instance, or you can do it on a per-user basis. Server-side encryption provides protection for data on external storage as the files are encrypted before they are sent to the server and the keys never leave the NextCloud server. A server-wide key stores a server password in the NextCloud data directory and uses it to decrypt the server key in the user's data directory, which is in turn used to decrypt data. So this means that if I can get to, and I'm going to flip this on its head, but if I can get to that server-wide key that's stored in the NextCloud data directory, I can decrypt every user's key and therefore their files. Reading on. When using per-user keys, the keys in the data directory is per-user and encrypted with the user's password. Yeah, we take great care to ensure keys never enter storage, but keys will be kept in memory on the NextCloud server for the duration of user login sessions to facilitate decryption and encryption of data. So to sum this up, we have two different types that we could do. We could have a master server-wide key, which is used to decrypt everything. Or we can have a per-user key, which is decrypted by the user's password itself. And then that's used to encrypt your personal stuff. Now, this is mainly for encrypting stuff to remote storage because what Nextcloud has the ability to do is operate on a backend storage like an object storage or any other kind of S3 compatible or NFS or yada, 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 right? So what you could do is you could have that key that's on your NextCloud server and you can store stuff in your S3 bucket that's encrypted. Now that that remote storage doesn't have access to your server key. Only the server has access to the server key. So it's on your server, server can read it and encrypt stuff before it sends it onto right. the remote storage, right? But if you're talking about encrypting stuff with the server key on local storage, anyone who has access to that server as it's running has access to that key, key and right. therefore has access to all the storage locally. So your, your threat model here is if your S3 storage or your remote storage gets compromised, everything on there is encrypted if you're using a server-wide key. But if your NextCloud server gets compromised, then everything on that NextCloud server can be decrypted with the key that's also on your NextCloud server. So that means that the server-side encryption protects data on storage as long as that storage is not on the same server as NextCloud itself. That's with a huge asterisk though, because per user keys, only 
offer additional protection over a server-wide key in the case of physical theft of the Nexod server, which we're talking about. Someone grabs it and scampers yeah. off. Yeah. And storage or a security breach of the server itself, provided the users do not log in for the duration of the breach, right? Because you can almost think of a per user key as a server wide key on a different scale. You can say the the key that's stored on there decrypts all my files, right? But luckily, sure. it's not stored there unencrypted. It's only unencrypted when I log in. So it's actually, if someone pops your server and you're able to you know they they're able to move around wherever they want and and they can find your key your key's still going to be encrypted unless you're logged in now how often does your mobile account log in how often does your desktop client log in every 30 seconds by default so if that's the case you're still you know vulnerable to it right you're vulnerable to it yeah so there's there's a little little caveat here now if if your server goes offline, you know, and, and there's no Lux encryption on there, if that's not implemented yet, then yeah, you would you would not be logging in and you would not be decrypting your, your login key. Uh, but if if you have anything set up to sync, I mean that's really that's really a big big red flag to say, hey, that's this isn't really going to prevent someone who's just squatting on that server from eventually figuring out what your data is now on a, in addition to that both these server-side encryption models do not protect against any type of uh, uh metadata attack like they can see all the files and folders and names sure. and directory sure. and who's logged in and everything right they can they can see all of that stuff you're, you know you're not encrypting the directory names of the file names or or whatnot 2021 taxes taxes.csv right it's exactly fine you can exactly. see the file you can see it was last modified yep every everything's on there everything's on there for you so especially if you had you know two files you said show to the irs and then you had another file that said never show to the irs exactly you would know about the the presence of both of those files Without implementing remote storage, there's not a whole lot of benefit that you're going to grab from a server-side encryption, right? What you would be looking for is a file-level encryption or an even an end-to-end -end encryption, which is very, very hard to implement, but NextCloud has taken a lot of time to engineer this. Have you ever gone through any kind of, like, OPSEC or cryptography proofs or, or anything like that? Uh, you know what? I started to go through, I picked up a cryptography book. Um, is it Cracking the Code? Is that the big, is that the famous one? I started to go through it. I started to read the math and I was like, mm, nope. And then same, well, I was going through Bitcoin action. I was like, oh, let me just read about, you know, all the SHA stuff and like. So I have here the handbook of applied cryptography it's it's pretty bad and and i wish i'd looked this up earlier but but they have a they have a couple different things in here to consider yeah so so like one of the things you're not going to think about about end, end encryption right and 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 i guess i'll touch on that really quick so end, end encryption is basically um i i start encrypting stuff on my device using my client and then send it up somewhere and then it's always encrypted to the server like the server knows nothing about it. It doesn't know the name, doesn't know the contents. It can't decrypt the contents. There's nothing up there. There's nothing I can do to decrypt it while it's still up there. The only thing I can do is copy it back down and decrypt it locally, right? Which is fairly secure because that means anyone who's sitting over on the other side of that server can't know anything. Right, right. But one of the interesting things is uh, the, the concept of using a browser to do this because they said note that the very nature of end-to-end -end encryption means that there's no access to data through the web interface nor any public sharing. So we'll talk about drawbacks in a second here. The, uh, this is because a browser would need to decrypt the files locally for the user to see them. But the code to do that has to come in the form of JavaScript from the server. This would break the trust model 
end-to-end -end encryption is meant to protect from the server, and thus one can't trust the code from the server to decrypt the data and not send a copy of the secure key to a third-party server or what have you. So, so if you're trying to protect against a compromised server, you can't use code from that server to open something. You, you, you literally cannot trust it. You know, you could probably audit it, but are you going to do that every time you want to decrypt a file? Heck no. No. So this is only on the desktop clients and, and mobile clients that NextCloud authors. Now, this is actually a official application that they provide, um, which seems to be in a fairly alpha state. So I'm not even sure if I'm comfortable recommending this to new people. Um, but what I would say is that the the rest of their end-to-end -end encryption is is a good read. I mean, it's it's what you would expect, right? They have a, a lot of good ideas. Um, they have identity protection. They have trust on first use model. You know, just, just different ways to set this up so that it makes sense and is easy and is also secure at the same time. So they've, they've done a good job. Don't get me wrong. But there are a lot of drawbacks. You know, you can't access anything on the server. You know, we were talking about only Office before, right? You, you, if you encrypted an Office document using end-to-end -end encryption, right. you would not be able to open it on the server. The server cannot read it. Um, you know, you, you can't share anything with anyone because there's no files to be shared, and, and they can't decrypt it, right? So you can't... The, Currently, you can't share it with anyone. So there are a lot of drawbacks that there are currently with this. And, and I linked to a couple bits of documentation on uh, their end-to-end -end and you know what's up coming next and what's on their roadmap and, and stuff to be implementing there. Uh, and, and it all looks good, right? So I'm, I'm very excited about it. And, and I think that it definitely has its use case. But for your every regular day-to-day -day operations of your next cloud service right this is going to be overkill and actually going to take away functionality that you would need that you would want you know it, it, that that next cloud explodes i i can't tell you how many times this in the past week that i've been able to upload you know uh videos to someone to, to share because i can't share it on on discord Right. right, because it has an eight megabyte limit. So, like, where am I supposed to put it? Do I have to create right. my own YouTube channel and upload private, unlisted videos and send them the link to it and to just put it on my oh. file server? They can download right. it or not, up to them. And I, I, I think doing doing Sound something like right. this for literally everything, literally everything, takes away from really what you need to implement, which. I think well, if is you what need we have security, planned. it's there. I think yeah. that I think that's one of the main the key points is it, if you need it, it is there. If you want to force people into using the client, the desktop and the mobile client only, and you're not going to share data outside of that next cloud instance, it's available to you. It's there. But there in are also in practical use. To, yeah, in practical use, it's not. I look at it as not something I would use on a day to day basis, basically. And, and there are other things to do, like there's C file. I'm trying to remember what it is, but there are applications that will just encrypt a file for you. Like if you want yeah. to do that, I would say, and, and actually this is probably something I, I should have gotten ready, but there's, there's like two or three applications that I've used in the past where I simply encrypted a, a file on my computer, right? And then once that file's encrypted and, and I only know the password, I can put that anywhere. I can put that up right. on Nextcloud. Right. I can do whatever I want, right? And I don't need like a fancy end-to-end -end encryption to you just to, put it up and yeah. it's already encrypted on the server, you know, on di on whatever disk. Doesn't exactly. matter. You encrypted it already. Exactly. And when I pull it down, I'm going to have the decryption key or I can send someone the email with the decryption key and they can pull it down for their own selves. Yeah. Right, yeah. as long as you're you're on a device that has that that program to decrypt it, and you're using the correct parameters and and the password, and and that would be something out of band for Nextcloud. Nextcloud wouldn't even care about that, right? That would be something for you to set up in your own org. And really, you could do that with Nextcloud or sorry, Camboard's file uploads, or, or really 
Uh, any other, any, I, I'd say Bitwarden yeah. actually would probably be a better option for you even at that point. Uh, but yeah, there, there's plenty of things you can do um, that are a much easier solution than than something like this. Now, they get some of these these kinks ironed out. It, it, it you know it, it may have its use in in small organizations, but uh, still, I think really where you're going to get the best bang for your buck as far as security is concerned, uh, you know the the realistic. Uh, exploits that we were talking about, right? If if you get that that data at rest, that encrypted data at rest, and that data encrypted in transport, that's where you're going to to see the most security, the the most easily maintained security posture, um, and and the most the most bang for your buck, to be honest, and right. and that's what I think I'm going to continue to pursue. Uh, that's uh, definitely still on the roadmap. And actually, note to self, I think we're going to make that roadmap public by the next episode because uh, I, I don't see any reason why not to. I've been yeah. kind of going through it uh, in my head, especially the way we have it with the duplicated tasks to the Q2 project and then yeah. the child yeah, yeah, yeah. child tasks. I don't see any reason why we don't put that Publish into it, yeah. you know, public and, and, and expose that as a public roadmap. And then you'll see stuff uh, you'll see this exact stuff on there because this is stuff that we are uh, marching towards implementing. So most of this this information uh, I threw in the Nextcloud encryption uh, page. Uh, it's in the advanced customization chapter of the Nextcloud book, and I I just thought it'd be it'd be something good to go over. I mean I've I've gotten a couple queries before on it. And I think it, it was a good time to just sit down and kind of hash out all the details in order for us to have answers when, when people ask these kind of questions or, or really anyone uh, asks these kind of questions, whether it's about Nextcloud, you know, or, or whether it's about anyone else's service. I mean, this is something that you should be asking of the operators of the services that you're, you're using. I mean, you, you should absolutely know if, if you're protected in transit, are you protected? You know, is your data protected at rest? Um, are you, you know, what what are you doing about backup and and, and other kinds of encryption? So, uh, I, I thought this was a good place to start. If I have any more to add on it, uh, I certainly will do so. But I, I'm I'm happy with with what we were with what I was able to come up with there. Yeah, absolutely. I liked it. I enjoyed it. I'm trying to think what I was laughing so hard at. Uh, oh, yeah, HTTPS isn't going to prevent you from being scammed. <laughs> I'm going to hold on to that tidbit. <laughs> oh, I got a kick out of that one. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to be the buzzkill. I mean, it kind of does. It kind of does. I mean. So, hold on. What, what are the cert types? Because you can get... Uh, you can get... Uh, there's a few. Um, here it is. Hold on. Types of SSLs. There's like three, right? I there's remember three or this. Four. I remember this because I remember there's I went to serverguy.com before. Remember serverguy.com? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't remember that. There's three or four cert types, right? Yeah. So there is domain validated. There's organization validated and extended validated. Extended yeah. Validation. Oh, and that extended validated is a fortune. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what key.com gets. Uh, and and then you'll see in the browser too. I mean, your your browser will show you know whether your connection is secure, uh, and then whether it's secured by an organization validated cert. It's going to be green instead of just the lock. And if it's an extended validation cert, it's going to be green plus the lock plus the name of the institution, you know, next to the URL that is actually validated. And I think that's pretty cool that's that's a way and and also that's an upsell too i mean you're you're upselling people on that's your brand the ability for other people to trust you yeah exactly right. you're, you're selling that brand so uh very interesting to see that and 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 yeah so i mean if you go to key.com and it doesn't say key.com it's probably not key.com if you didn't mention it it's honestly even if it's just a quick link like Obviously, you're gonna go to when some, whenever the bank sends a note. You're gonna I'm gonna type in the bank address on my URL. Some people are will click the link, which can redirect you, and you're like, oh well, they sent me there, and it, you know all the UI looks the same. It's like, well, you're getting hacked. Yeah, 
bank key bank that are you <laughs> key dot are you <laughs> <laughs> no but um i did enjoy that one because it you know anymore it, it someone's getting scammed every day so yep um but yeah is there anything else you wanted to add i, I thought you did a great job explaining well, it now applied crypto- cryptography we'll have to save for a uh another day i think i i couldn't i couldn't oh man <laughs>